our societies have been systematically changing nature to make them better for us, trying to, though often we then get unintended consequences that make problems worse for us. We've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years. But now, uh, since particularly with the great explosion in human population and the increase in technologies and the continual burning of fossil fuels, we're now making changes on a scale unimaginable and that will have very, very serious consequences if we don't deal with them. Welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast, a podcast series that tackles some of the big questions in the field of environmental politics for university students in Canada. I'm Ryan Katzrozine from the University of Ottawa, co-host of the show along with Dr. Peter Andre from Carleton University. And in this episode, we're talking with Dr. James Meadowcroft, a professor in both the School of Public Policy and Administration and in the Department of Political Science at Carleton University. And we want to get his help in introducing and contextualizing some of the core themes of ecopolitics in a Canadian context. He's written extensively on environmental politics and policy, sustainable development, and the low carbon society. And in particular, James is currently the research director of the Transition Accelerator at Carleton University. I'm looking forward to him sharing a little bit about what that work is about. James, welcome to the show. Can you take a couple of minutes just to tell us how you see the field of ecopolitics or environmental politics? And how did you come to it? Hi, Peter and Ryan. It's great to be here with you today to talk about this field. Um, well, uh, I guess um, for me, ecopolitics is all the way it's that anything to do with the environment intersects with uh, social and political uh, phenomena. So it's really a very, uh, quite a, a, a broad field. Um, and for me, for instance, that's reflected in um, how I teach my introductory course on this issue, where we spend some weeks uh, on environmental philosophy that uh, deals with things like what our conceptions of nature are and how we believe uh, human beings should uh, behave vis-a-vis uh, phenomena in the natural world, be they animals or ecosystems and so on. We talk um, about environmental um uh, economics, uh, how do people value the environment? How can you put monetary value on different aspects of the environment? And what do people try to do with this valuation? And then all sorts of particular areas of politics. So international politics, um, how the environment enters into international treaties and negotiations and disputes among countries, environmental movements and groups, how people have organized to defend endangered species or to enact uh, create national parks or to fight against pollution or also to fight against um, injustices and inequities inequ- linked to um, the environment. I'm curious to hear how you see this area of environmental politics fitting into political science as a whole. It's interesting because um, over time, this has become a more significant area of political science. But Actually, when I was starting my career back in the early 90s, um, interest, in, interest in green issues and the environment was really seen as, as pretty much marginal to the core of political science. I mean, I remember when I was a young lecturer at Sheffield, that after I'd been there a couple of years, the head of department actually kind of pulled me aside for a private chat and said, "You, I really should think about giving up uh, interest in this topic if I wanted to you know, make a successful career and become a professor uh, because he says nobody's interested in that. It doesn't change the results of elections. It doesn't interest parties. Um, give it up. Mm. Uh, of course, I, I I didn't give it up, which I'm I'm glad about because what happened over the, the intervening 25 or 30 years is that the environment has become ever more central to contemporary political discourse uh, and argument. And in fact, today, there are elections that turn quite heavily on environmental issues like climate change. Well, it does. And I know that you've spent a lot of time thinking carefully about how the environment has emerged on the political scene. And in particular, the whole notion of sustainable development and how that's become an important activity that governments all around the world are involved in to realign their various activities. So 
Could you tell us about what the environment has become in the political agenda of governments, especially in the global north? So I'll, I'll answer your question, Peter, but in a slightly roundabout way, in the sense that I'll start back in um, kind of before the 1950s. And um, we today, the environment is so closely integrated to everything that we do. If you open a newspaper, you'll see half a dozen articles dealing with it or look at them online and so on. Um, and you can't imagine a platform of a political party that doesn't deal with certain kinds of uh, environmental issues. But the truth is that the environment as we know it is a kind of, as a kind of political conception, is actually a reasonably recent uh, phenomena. If you go back to the 1930s, the 40s, and the 50s, you will hardly find the word environment even used in the con in the way in which we use it uh, today. Hmm. Of course, environment meant surroundings, but what happens in the 1960s is, for a variety of reasons, a bunch of issues that are seen before as separate, like air pollution, uh, natural national parks, conservation of nature begin to be pulled together and linked in this word of envi- uh, this kind of conception of environment. And the way I characterize it is the environment as it emerges in the uh, late 1960s and early 70s is kind of all that surrounds us, that sustains hum- humanity, but that we are in the process of, of screwing up. <laughs> so the environment is kind of <laughs> a vulnerable thing, which is essential to sustain hmm. us and yet being threatened by our very activity. And what happens then is Mm. that groups that were quite disparate, um, some group trying to fight against local air pollution or preserve a local lake or beauty spot, suddenly begin to see themselves as, oh, this isn't just the bad quality in my town. This is saving the environment from the harm that industrial civilization is doing it. So this becomes very powerful. And it's it's interesting that it's exactly at this time, the late 60s and early 70s, that the industrialized countries, um, within the span of about five or six years, the major ones, all create environment ministries or environment agencies. They create expert committees of Uh, scientists to provide advice to government. And many of them pass national clean air acts or uh, national clean water acts. Um, And then a few years later, waste, uh, toxic waste management acts and so on. So suddenly, once you begin to think of the environment in this way, then you, the kind of question is, well, how do we protect it? Well, then we turn to the state or to the government. So it makes sense to set up a ministry to protect the environment from um, the the kind of ravages of of industrial civilization. And what happens over the next 20 or so years, governments, and it's almost coordinated within the OECD, pass a whole raft of regulations, which actually did make a lot of difference over time in cleaning up some of the worst abuses, for instance, um, uh, lead contamination in the environment. And yet after 20 years, so now we're talking into the, the, the 1990s, more problems kept coming. And some of those hmm. that were being dealt hmm. with um, were very persistent and not dealt with at all. And this um, hmm. in the, the kind of... Um, 1990s, late 80s, 90s, led to a reformulation or rethinking of how the environment and how we can protect it uh, could take place. And that was when the idea of sustainability or sustainable development started to come to the fore. And what the, uh, the kind of critics of this first generation of environmental policy said was, well, the early instinct in the early 70s or late 60s was we have a problem, we'll set up a ministry and it will deal with the problem just the way we've set up a ministry of transport or whatever to deal with particular problems. And the regulations that they passed, as I said, made some difference. But the problem with that is that all the other ministries were busy trashing the environment. So basically it's like, uh, you know, a gentleman running behind an elephant with a broom. 
um, trying to sweep up the mess <laughs> because the Ministry of Transport looks and says, well, we need roads. We have transport problem. Let's build the roads. And the Ministry of Mines said, we need mines. Let's build mines. And they were kind of trashing the environment as a byproduct of their activity with one junior minister ministry trying to, 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 to uh, rectify the situation. So that really the idea came to the fore that what we need to do is integrate environmental considerations early in the decision-making process. That's to say, when we make decisions about development, integrate the environment in a way that so that we consider both economic development, social equity and social mm -hmm. issues, but also environmental issues in the very making of that of those decisions. So maybe we realize, well, we, maybe we should build a better system of transport than just roads. If we're going to have mines, well, we have to mm. think from the beginning about disposal of the mine waste uh, and so on. That's a, a good basis to start from. And you've given a really good history, really, of the sort of the evolution of thought in terms of how we're thinking about uh, sustainability and environment within the political sphere. Um, you know, you've told us about how this is an all-encompassing issue in many ways, um, and also spawning new challenges uh, as we're kind of working to find ways of integrating environmental considerations into policy. I want to turn to a, a more specific discussion um, about maybe environmental politics in the Canadian context and a particular issue within the sphere of environmental politics that might be of interest to you. So uh, I suppose a way of asking this is, you know, what's an issue that relates to an eco-politics that preoccupies you uh, from day to day in your work as an environmental political scientist? I would say the issue that most absorbs me um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis is that of a, the transition to a low-carbon economy. Um, and that obviously rate hmm. relates to climate change. But I would like to just mention a couple of other issues um, that I think are also important, but that we tend to forget about. In some ways, hmm. um, air pollution is almost the beginning um, in terms of national environmental policy. Um, there was a lot of air pollution regs earlier in the 20th century, but it was mainly cities that solved the problem. Uh, so Toronto, for instance, um, had a big air pollution problem. The fogs in London are well known and so on. So since air pollution was mainly right. understood as a local problem, it was handled locally. What happened in the 1970s is that people began to understand the larger dimensions of air pollution, that uh, pollution could be transported mm. between uh, North America and Europe, between England and the continent and so on. Um, and there you had the emergence of issues like acid rain, for instance, um, which was uh, very important in the Canadian context for uh, as a focus for the environmental movement and then eventually of regulations and interactions between Canada and uh, the United States uh, and so on. One of the interesting things about this, and I, I referred uh, earlier to the fact that some things have we've made real progress on, uh, and um, sulfur dioxide emissions is one of those examples because it uh, caused off acid rain. It came particularly from uh, emissions from coal-powered uh, uh, coal electricity plants. That has been in Canada, but also no. elsewhere in the o OECD, dramatically reduced. Not just reduced as a percentage of our production or GDP or something like that, but absolutely uh, reduced to a quite a low level compared uh, to, to what it was uh, 30 or 40 years ago. And yet, in some ways, air pollution is constantly bringing new problems to the fore where we realize we haven't mm. really cracked the issue. And, and there are two things I'd highlight there. Mm. One is that with the increasing advance in um, medicine, uh, and epidemiology and so on, we understand that air pollution is way more damaging than people thought it was um, mm. 50 years ago or even a decade ago. So now we know that mm. air pollution, particularly particulates, don't just uh, cause asthma. They cause cardiovascular issues. Uh, they may be linked to dementia um, there are a whole series of issues. And I was heard a recent uh, interview with a scientist who said she'd been 
this is a bit gruesome, but dissecting bodies of young children, and she had not found oh a gosh. tissue in their body that did not have particulates contaminating it from the brain hmm. to the lungs to the kidney uh, and so on. So and, and and that's that's air pollution, and we we, we haven't even got <laughs> gotten to climate change and carbon dioxide, although they're interrelated. Yeah. Absolutely, but just to finish up on on the air pollution thing. So one side of it is we understand it's much more dangerous now than we did than we did before, and there's some evidence, for instance, in the recent COVID uh, crisis that. Um, people in areas with high pollution had much high, higher mortality rates than people in lower pollution areas. But the other thing is we keep finding mm. new pollutants that we didn't know about. So, for instance, the latest one is microplastics, which uh, get chewed up in teensy little fibers and then blown into the air. And there are scientists recently who've been looking mm. at plastic fallout over London and Paris and so on. And we know now that these microplastics make it into the human body, but there's not, we don't yet have research about what it does, but the assumption has to be, is it probably isn't, isn't particularly good for us. So I would say that air pollution, we've done an enormous amount on, but it hasn't gone away. And I guess the other example there is yeah. nitrous oxide emissions. People may have heard of the Volkswagen scandal where Volkswagen was tricking the <laughs> testing on um, diesel engines. So many European cities in particular, because there are more diesels there, um, have quite bad um, uh, air quality. And when I say they tricked the test, they did trick mm. the test. But the test had also been designed in such a way that they were kind of almost inviting you to trick them. Since the way they test engines is mm. put a car up on a block tell the car it's about to be tested, test it for 30 minutes, and that's it. <laughs> there was no actual testing like on hills or in rain or in cold weather. Um, yeah. There should All have right. been a pop quiz. <laughs> I, I had one of those those so-called green diesel uh, VWs. But, but James, if I can sort of ask you about to, to, to maybe get to the, mat, the, the heart of the matter of the, the political aspect of this, or even the political economic uh, aspect of this. Um, you know, we live in a, in a particular political economic context in Canada. We have certain types of industries that have been favored. We have a long political economic history in this country organized around resource extraction and production of certain resources, which have contributed to the problems you're talking about, air pollution, other types of pollution, and and climate change, which we, we haven't uh, d delved into yet. Um, but maybe you can give us a sense, uh, and especially, you know, the listener, the student listener in particular, how that Canadian political economic context shapes some of these issues that, that uh, you know, you're, that keep, keep you up at night, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Um Certainly. And, and maybe I'll use it as a, an excuse to talk a little bit about um, climate change then. So we know that <clears throat> globally climate change is a, is a, is a problem. Um, to solve it, we've got to basically stop emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, and that means moving away from fossil fuels that have powered um, industrial civilization for the past 200 years. So Canada, as you say, has had a very, um, has a, a resource uh, dependent industry. And we today have a very carbon intensive lifestyle. So you can see that in two ways. I mean, one is we actually have a big fossil fuel extraction industry, mainly oil and gas, and particularly uh, people know well about, about the tar sands. And that's a big, um, has been a big contributor to economic growth in this country. But also, um, hmm. if you look at the carbon intensity of our economic output, this is not just the oil and the gas, but how, mu how much greenhouse gases we emit for every dollar of output that we produce, Canada has one of the most intensive uh, carbon intensive economies in, in the world. And the reason is hmm. for this, people often say, oh, well, we're a big country, so you have to travel a lot, or... Um, it's, we're a cold country, so we have to heat a lot. And of course, both of those are true. But the main reason is because um, 
our economy, as you said, is resource intensive. And high carbon in that sense has actually been a competitive advantage over the past hundred years. So Canada did not compete Hmm. with Germany, say, on making the best machine tools or the United States uh, on having the best uh, rocket industry or, or whatever you, or even cultural industries. What we had competed on is providing natural resources and doing the resource processing, which has high energy needs. So Canada is swimming in energy. We've got hydro, we got fossil fuels, we got wind, we got solar, we got wood, you know, from coast to coast. And cheap energy and cheap land were the two fundamental things that built the Canadian economy. Um, and the cheap land contrasts directly with the experience in the United Kingdom or Germany or even France, where land is, is uh, you know, has ha- high values and people have to be very careful. I mean, look at how our cities are built. Yes, we have skyscrapers downtown, but then we roll out big box stores, one story things, miles and miles. But, of course, it has a big energy penalty because these uh, uh, buildings have high uh comparatively high carbon footprints and low occupancy rates. So there is an important path dependence or historical element in why we are in the place that we are today. I wanted to ask you about the transition to the low carbon economy. You've been eloquently, I think, explaining why Canada has had a rather high carbon budget. And I know your work is really about thinking about how we turn the ship. And maybe in responding to that, I said at the beginning that you've been involved in this project called the Transition Accelerator. Can you tell us a bit more about how that fits into your understanding of where we need to go now? So um, uh, last year, um, over the past, maybe it's even a bit more, I worked with uh, a a number of colleagues in different parts of the country to create a a new uh, not-for-profit organization called the Transition Accelerator. And this, the kind of mission of this organization is to Um, accelerate Canada's response to the problem of uh, climate change, to decarbonize the economy, but particularly to link these challenges, this challenge to other transformational processes that um, are taking place in the economy uh, economy as a whole. A lot of my academic work Mm -hmm. over the last decade has been working on um, what uh, in the literature they call socio-technical transitions. Um, And these are transitions or big changes in major systems of uh, social social provisioning. Um, And so I'll give you an example would be the mobility system, how we get how we get around. The agro food system um, is uh, another example, the electricity system. So if we look at technological development over a longer span, say 200 years or something like that, what we see is that mostly development in these systems that are both social and technical um, proceeds by incremental change. Um, they're, they're gradual improvements that make the way things function more efficient um, over time, but that periodically they go through much more d- dramatic system reconfigurations. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I, I, I call these things socio-technical systems because they're both social and technical. So if you just think about the electricity system, for example, it's a bunch of wires that connect power dams and power plants hmm. through transformers and end up in people's houses and then charge your mobile phone or what, run the dishwasher or whatever. So it's a technical system. But it's also a social system because... Um, it involves relations between all sorts of entities. So there are power producers that have legal relations with distribution companies. There are laws about uh, regu- that regulate who can plug in what to the system. There are all sorts of rules of thumb by which engineers decide what's allowed and what isn't allowed. There are property rights, who owns what and who owes what to whom. So if you think about all our big systems, like the transport system based around the car, they have all these dense social regulations and rules and relationships, as well as the physical connection between oil going into the the gasoline, going into the tank of your car and so on. So these big systems, if we look back in history, we see that there are lots of examples 
where they changed in a major way. So think about the birth of the modern automobile. So we replaced a system that was largely horse-drawn transport or perhaps streetcars um, with a system of independent cars owned by, uh, you know, mostly by individual families or companies driven with an internal combustion engine powered with, with gasoline. And as we built out the automotive economy, once Ford had kind of mastered uh, mass production, um, these, this automobile system transformed our cities. Suddenly people could live in suburbs and work a long way from home. It changed the way people had vacations. Mm. Um, before people had to take the railroad and stay in a railroad hotel. Now the motel was born and so on and so on. And linked into this system, we have garages and companies and loan companies and the advertising industry, the traffic police, ticket <laughs> system, parking lots, the whole structure of physical of, of our cities changed. So this that's an example of such a socio-technical transition, but there are others too. The the ship the shift from sailing ships to steamships, the emergence of modern manufacturing, the digital revolution that we've been going through over the past thirty years. So the basic idea of the ex transition accelerator is to say we can learn from these major transitions, and we can draw lessons for the sorts of changes we need to do. Uh, in order to gauge with, engage with climate change. Because when we look at the magnitude of the climate question, it's clear that it's not just about cutting a few emissions here or there. It's not just marginal changes to these systems. We have grown so dependent over the past couple of hundred years on fossil fuels that if we want a system that works without fossil fuels, we need to dramatically change change those systems. Yeah, and it's not just a theoretical idea. It's also being picked up by governments all over the world who are starting to think about zero carbon economies by certain dates like 2050 or even sooner. So there's a lot at stake, isn't there, in making these transitions? Absolutely. And I mean, now the, the kind of latest expression is net zero by mid-century. So that, in other words, squeeze carbon emissions out completely, or if there are any residual ones, they have to be counterbalanced with some form of carbon absorption, like planting trees or something like this. So the uh, in the work, its work, the accelerator basically um, tries to link the low carbon transition with other disruptive forces that are going on in these uh, different sectors. So if you think about the personal transport sector, for instance, which has been based on cars now for, for a century in Canada, um, all sorts of things are shaking up this sector. So there's the emergence of electric vehicles. There is the possibility of self-driving vehicles. There are new business models for car sharing like Uber and Lyft. There's the fact that increasingly young people are not so obsessed with getting their first car as they were 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and so these things are starting to change the sector to make it very dynamic and fluid. So for the accelerator, what we want to do is work with innovators in business, in government, to say, how do we accelerate these changes? For instance, the electrification of personal transport, so that the results will be good for society and good for the environment. You know, you mentioned the word disruption, James, and, uh, you know, and, and seeking good outcomes for society. One of the things we talked about earlier in, in our introductory uh, episode to this podcast was was how you know one of the, the focuses of uh, of ecopolitics is to discuss winners and losers, and so maybe one one question for you about the transition accelerators, you know, how do you how do you take into account the the losers <laughs> in transition? I imagine that when we're advocating uh, a transition away from fossil fuels, and we talked about earlier how Canada has been fundamentally dependent on the fossil fuel sector. How do you do that in a way that is just that is that that accounts for, you know, the interests and the people and the the, the real you know families that are impacted by by that kind of a transition? So you're absolutely right. Um, one of those lessons that we can learn from past um, transitions, uh, you know, the emergence of modern agriculture with 
fertilizer-based or, or the shift away from horse transport or whatever, is there are always uh, winners and losers. And even if society as a whole gains from the advance, so very few of us would like to go back to kind of getting out and brushing down the horse and saddling it up to go to work, um, cars are much more convenient. Even if society gains, there are always uh, groups, could be workers, it can be um, owners of businesses, but it can also be whole regions who are disadvantaged by what can for society as a whole be a, a positive transition. Um, so for the work of the accelerator, and it's clearly an important political issue, as you suggest, we need to see how do we... Um, how do we manage these processes so the collateral damage, if you like, is is minimized? And so that, for instance, with workers, that uh, we develop alternative industries and uh, forms of employment. We provide retraining for people so they can occupy other jobs and so on. Uh, I mean, in Canada, in the fossil fuel sector, it's really clear because a couple of provinces I mean, many provinces produce fossil fuels, but particularly Alberta and Saskatchewan, perhaps to some extent Newfoundland, are really heavily dependent on the fossil fuel industry. And as those industries hmm. shrink in the future, um, it's going to cause a significant uh, economic disruption. I mean, one thing to note, hmm. however, is that the fossil fuel industry in particular is itself a cyclic cyclical industry. And Alberta, for instance, has had a cycle of booms and bust ever since um, oil was first uh, kind of discovered and the industry developed there. Um, and recently we have seen one of those busts accentuated with the, um, uh, the, co the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So James, can you give us a practical example where you, with the Transition Accelerator Project, you've been thinking through potentially supporting one of these transition pathways that also has these co-benefits, not just about the environment, but also about health or economic well-being in this country. And maybe given what Ryan was just pointing out around uh, potential losers in transitions, can you talk about how the work that you've been doing really thinks about their needs and how to bring that into the process of transition? I mean, the pathways that we've started work on so far, one is around hydrogen uh, as a fuel source for heavy trucking. Uh, but also for some difficult to decarbonize heavy industry sectors in Canada, like uh, steel uh, and cement and so on. Um, we're also working on integration of the power systems in the, in the northeast of uh, North America. Um, and we're also working around uh, buildings and um, improving the heating systems and the cooling systems and the insulation and so on in buildings. Uh, buildings are for one of the kind of biggest, if you look at the biggest emissions uh, sectors in Canada, it's fossil fuel production, it's uh, transport um, followed very uh, quickly by, um, by uh, buildings. Of course, there's some from the agri-food system and so on. In each of those three examples, there are uh, elements that touch this just transition, if you like, issue that you're raising. For instance, the hydrogen economy, one of the things that uh, is appealing about this for the, this is for really heavy trucks, the biggest, the tandem things that roar up and down the high, highways out west. Um, they're rather difficult to electrify with batteries because the batteries are actually so heavy, it significantly compromises the load that the truck can take. And they also take a long time to recharge, which isn't good for um, these sorts of heavy freight movements. So it turns out that um, hydrogen works quite well as uh, a, f a fuel for these trucks. But one of the interesting things is that you can make hydrogen both from electrolysis that's to say from renewables, if you have wind, which is blowing when nobody needs the power, you can use the excess power to make hydrogen um, from windmills or solar or whatever. Um, but you can also make it from through something called methane reforming, which basically takes natural gas uh, and makes it into hydrogen. Now, the way they do it now has lots of GHG emissions, but there's no reason you couldn't do carbon capture and storage on that and reduce the you know 90% plus of the emissions. 
So if you developed hydrogen as a fuel source for uh, heavy trucks out west, um, it would offer a lifeline, if you like, to the existing oil and gas industry. In other words, it offers them a pathway towards being net zero so that where they would no longer produce bitumen from the tar sands and export that they could instead ultimately become a net zero energy exporter, uh, which could be electricity or it could also be hydrogen. So there's a political aspect to this hydrogen pathway to help both kind of neutralize the opposition from the big vested interests, but also to provide opportunities for employment and for jobs in a, in a decarbonizing economy. Um, and just to give an example of the work we've done on that, we've just recently created something called the Hotlands Task Force on Hydrogen for Alberta. And we've got involved the mayors of um, Edmonton, uh, Wood Buffalo, and, and four other regions, plus provincial, plus federal officials, and academic experts, and various stakeholders. And they're all discussing you know, could there be a hydrogen future, a net zero hydrogen future for Alberta looking looking forward? A much simpler example around buildings, um, and this is something where the, the task force for resilient recovery post-COVID that I've been involved in, one of our proposals was that the government should spend several billion dollars uh, establishing a fund to retrofit buildings in Canada to make them more energy efficient. Um, and this is an example of something that it's good for climate change um, because it will reduce the emissions from natural gas, from uh, building heating and stuff like that. But it's also uh, particularly good for um, poor and lower income families because they spend a disproportionate amount of their uh, income uh, on heating expenses uh, in winter. Uh, and we even propose in that proposal, we, 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 we suggest particular funds to favor uh, low income communities in, in, um, in this retrofit program. So that's another way where you can dovetail something that is to do with decarbonizing and moving towards a, a, a low carbon economy and something that deals engages directly with equity issues today. This has been a really fascinating conversation, James. We've gone all over the place from a kind of history of how the environment came onto the political scene in the 1960s and 70s. And one of the things I was going to point out in relation to that is that just around that time that human beings first saw these photographs of the Earth from space and actually saw the potential fragility of this environment that we rely on, the biosphere floating around in the darkness of space. I think that's all part of what that political moment was in the late 60s and early 70s. And then you've taken us right through how air pollution is a domestic issue and a transboundary issue and some of the successes in addressing issues like sulfur dioxide. I think it's easy for students to feel like nothing has progressed in this field over time. But in fact, there's a lot of good news stories as we look back over how environmental issues have emerged and been dealt with politically and socially. And then you've really brought us into your current work with the transition accelerator to a low carbon economy. You and your colleagues are really trying to identify how socio-technical transitions work, how they worked historically, and how can we harness the lessons from that in trying to move forward transitions right now. You've also done a great job of addressing Ryan's question of the potential losers in those transitions and how you ensure that transitions are just. So maybe the last thing that I want to ask you is if listeners want to know more about the Transition Accelerator, where should they look? I mean, the two things I could suggest, one is that you can look up my profile at Carlton. Um, that's one starting place. And the other is that the Transition Accelerator does have uh, a website. If you just Google transitionaccelerator.ca, you will uh, be led uh, to this website. Um, I guess if I, you didn't quite invite me to do this, Peter, but if I, if I had a concluding <laughs> remark to say, which which I think um, I'd like to emphasize and I really try to emphasize to my students. I think there are two things to understand. One is that the trajectory on which we're on, in which the human impact on the environment has only grown over time, we've been on that for a very, very long time. So 
latest research suggests that thousands of years ago, um, human beings began to have a significant impact on the environment. We changed the distribution of species. Hmm. We changed the way water courses flow. We altered ecosystems and in a way that has had lasting consequences. So on one hand, we've been at this a very, very long time. But the other <laughs> thing is to say that particularly since, uh, you know, the past over the past 50 or 60 years, maybe since the end of World, World War II or something like that, since about 1950, there's been a step change in the pace uh, and character of the transformation that we're bringing to the, nat- the natural world. Thank you for that concluding note, James. And yeah, the, the, the time is now to act. That's sort of a, a common refrain for, our, for the end of these uh, episodes. But really appreciate your taking the time to speak with us and to help us introduce some of the big themes uh, relating to ecopolitics. And uh, that we should probably wrap things up for this episode of the Ecopolitics Podcast. Uh, but I want to remind listeners to make sure to check out the other episodes Uh, in the series, which are available at the website, uh, ecopoliticspodcast.ca. And don't forget uh, to, you know, like us on social media, share your feedback, get in touch. We'd love to hear from listeners and, uh, and hear what you think. So thank you, James. Thank you, Peter. Thank you to the listener. And once again, look forward to chatting with you all during the next episode. 